Hey everyone, this is Cinemax. Several months ago, I released my drum machine video featuring the Korg Electribe ER1 and how it was used in the first Metroid Prime game by Nintendo. I was really happy with how that featurette came out, and so I wanted to follow it up with another one, this time showing what's involved with recreating a Metroid Prime trilogy track from scratch. Whenever possible, we'll use the same music production gear and sample libraries to produce a replica of the original track. And with some luck, we'll do our best to find every synth preset and sample used in all three soundtracks. Once these sounds are identified, we'll transcribe every note and automation movement inside our digital audio workstation to assemble a near-perfect recreation. To give you some background, I started recreating Metroid Prime tracks back in 2019 using just software plugins and samples. Since then, I've learned a lot about the production of these soundtracks and used that knowledge to make more covers as well as original music produced in the Metroid Prime style. In this first part of the series, we'll go through all the known gear and sample libraries used in the original games, as well as taking a look at the various challenges and production techniques involved with putting this music together. These past couple of years, I consider myself very fortunate to be able to build up a collection of some of the synths and sound modules composer Kenji Yamamoto started using while working on the first Prime game 20 years ago. I feel really grateful to own this stuff and I want to share it as much as possible with all of you. That's one of the reasons why I'm making this video. Another reason is history preservation. There's little information as to how music and sound effects are produced at Nintendo, with only the occasional image or interview providing some clues. Only a few interviews with Yamamoto-san exist, and there are no pictures of his studio or gear. My hope is, is that with this mini-series, we can fill in the gaps on how these soundtracks were put together, and through that understanding, we can gain a newfound perspective and appreciation for how the music of Metroid Prime came to be. Before I start, a quick disclosure. As you'll see throughout this series, recreating music from any game with a high degree of accuracy is surprisingly difficult and requires a lot of effort. Even after all this work, there is the possibility of not being able to find any remaining missing sounds, and so there might be recreations that end up incomplete and may stay incomplete forever until someone finds the correct sounds. I'm not discouraging anyone from making their own recreations, but do understand that there is a difficulty curve and a chance for burnout which has happened before, and let me tell you, it's not fun. The first challenge when it comes to recreating music from any sort of video game or media is to find all the equipment used by the composers or producers. The amount of hours required to research through synths and sample libraries can easily add up. I initially started looking for gear used in Metroid Prime back in 2017, but it wasn't until almost two years later that I actually started making my first positive identifications. All this sifting through sample libraries and synth presets is sort of like an audio version of finding the needle in the haystack, and because of this, it is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to making these recreations. That being said, when you do stumble upon a sound you've been looking for for a long time, the feeling can be quite exhilarating, I must admit. So let's start off with what we know in terms of gear. Yamamoto-san had at least the following synths. A Korg MS-2000 Virtual Analog Synthesizer probably the rack model, the MS-2000R. While I don't own this synth, I do own the original model of the Korg MicroKorg, which happens to share the same synth engine, so we'll be loading the preset data from the MS-2000 into the MicroKorg to play those sounds. The MS-2000 is used a lot in all three soundtracks and contains many classic sounds that fans will recognize. At least two models of Korg Electribes were used as well. These two units are the EA-1 synth and the ER-1 drum machine. If you want to find out more about how the ER-1 was used specifically in Metroid Prime, you can check out my previously mentioned video in the description. Initially, I thought that the EA-1 was only used in Metroid Prime 1, but I soon discovered that it was also used in Metroid Prime 2, where it provides these sounds. When 
it comes to sound modules, Yamamoto-san used several Emu modules from the Proteus 2000 series. These include the Proteus 2000, the XL1 Turbo, the Orbit 3, and the Virtuoso 2000, known in Japan as the Proteus Orchestra. Like the Korg MS-2000, the Emu modules are used heavily throughout the trilogy. Each module has the same base hardware and firmware, with the only major difference being the ROMs installed inside each unit. These ROMs have a SIM form factor, and inside them is where all the sample and preset data is stored. The Proteus 2000 with the Composer ROM installed provides all kinds of instruments, synths, percussion, drones, and sound effects. It's sort of like a general purpose sound module in that regard. Current research seems to indicate that there's more Proteus 2000 presets in the first Metroid Prime game than compared to the others. Next up is the Emu XL1 Turbo, which is the more powerful version of the Emu Extreme Lead 1 and features a lot of the iconic synths heard in the Prime Trilogy. In addition to these two rack units, there's also a desktop module called the XL7 Command Station. Each Extreme Lead ROM is said to have all the sample data from the original Emu Orbit 9090 module released in 1996. It's important to point out that despite each Extreme Lead module sharing the same names and ROM sample data, there are some presets that have changed slightly between devices, and these include some sounds used in the Prime Trilogy. For example, the preset Boxed Mono, which was used in the multiplayer music for Prime 2, sounds normal on the Turbo module, and is monophonic, hence the name. But in the ROM for the XL7, the preset is set to polyphonic for some weird reason, and the sound's off. It's because of these findings that we believe the XL1 Turbo is the sound module that was actually used. I don't own this module, but I do have the correct XLEAD version 1.4 ROM found inside the Turbo, and it is currently installed in my Proteus 2000 alongside with the default Composer ROM. While the Emu Orbit 3 is used a decent amount in the first Metroid Prime game, it was used even more so in Metroid Prime 2. Much of the Luminoff, Ng, and Dark Samus sounds come from this module. Other than borrowing the name from the Orbit 9090, the Orbit 3 is a completely different module and contains two ROMs named Technosynth Construction Yard and Beat Garden, both produced by famous Dutch sound designer Rob Pappen. The Virtuoso 2000 is the most recent Emu gear discovery, and from what I can tell it seems to be the least used one in the soundtracks. This is where the intro of Frigate Orphean Escape and some of the orchestral percussion from Magmore Caverns originates from. To get those famous gothic choir sounds, Yamamoto-san used some sort of Roland sound canvas device, either the SC-880 or SC-88 Pro. A few other random presets heard in the Prime games come from these modules as well, such as the hi-hats from Chozo Ruins and the harp from Artifact Temple. During the making of this video, I was fortunate enough to add the SC-880 to my collection after searching for a couple of years. In terms of sample libraries, the main one used throughout all three Metroid Prime games is Uncivilized Grooves, produced by Z-Time. 
you could watch the interview I did with him on my YouTube channel. This library features much of the percussion and drums that the series is known for, and thanks to popular demand, the library is available for sale once again. Links to Uncivilized Grooves Remastered and Z Times Finspire website are in the description. Other sample libraries and plugins include Zero G Chemical Beats, Best Service XFX, East West Symphonic Choirs, and East West Symphonic Orchestra. Those last two plugins were used only in Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. There's still a few remaining presets and pieces of equipment that haven't been identified yet, so if you heard any Metroid Prime sounds off of some synth or a sample library, please let me know in the comments. This list pretty much sums up all the gear we know that was used by Kenji Yamamoto and the other composers who worked on the Prime Trilogy. So with all that out of the way, let's hook up the outboard gear so we can record it. You could use pretty much any digital audio workstation or DAW. I'm using FL Studio in this case. All we need is MIDI sequencing from the DAW so we can control the equipment and an audio interface to record it. I use an M-Audio Fast Track Ultra that has six inputs, so that means I can have a total of three synths with stereo audio hooked up to it at all times. The first two inputs are dedicated to my two EMU modules, whereas the third input is shared between the remaining synths. If I need to hook up the microcorg, I just plug the audio cables in and use my Yamaha UX16 MIDI USB interface to control it. And then whenever I need to record something off of the EA one, for example, I just switch the cables over to that synth instead. It's a pretty modular setup. Okay, let's look for some presets. Scrolling through synth presets or sample libraries requires a lot of patience. And while a lot of sounds are immediately recognizable, others require more careful analysis. This can be due to several factors, such as presets that are hard to hear in the original reference track, or there's a particular way to get the right sound by how the notes are sequenced. For example, holding down two notes at the same time is very important to get the right sound for the EA-1 preset used in Torvis Catacombs. To confirm that we found an audio match, we use a spectrum view of the reference track and then compare it to our recorded audio to see if the frequency patterns mirror each other. Sometimes we can get exact matches, and other times we can make educated guesses as to what was used or how the preset was manipulated. This method is great for double checking fast arpeggios or elements that are difficult to hear. Anytime I'm unsure about something, I go straight to the spectrum view. External effects processing seems to be used sparingly in the Metroid Prime soundtracks. With the Uncivilized Groove samples, they are used completely dry, with no effects added to them, not even compression or EQ. Synth presets that already have their onboard effects enabled, like delay or reverb, are usually left as is. There are some sounds throughout the games that seem to use other kinds of external effects, and to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what could have been used to generate those particular instances. In situations like this, we'll recreate the effect as closely as possible with plugins. According to sound designer Clark Wen in his interview with Kiwi Talks, Kenji Yamamoto had three months to create the soundtrack for Metroid Prime 1. With that insight, it's easy to see why using presets can greatly help speed up production. Considering the amount of music that needs to be written for a modern game, it's just too much work to create every single synth sound from scratch in such a short amount of time. Using presets also allows what I like to call sound palettes, that is, intentionally reusing the same sounds to create familiar ambiences. This style guide allows for a sense of cohesiveness that spans throughout all three soundtracks. For example, Metroid Prime 1's Talon Overworld and Metroid Prime 2's Torvis Bog not only share a lot of the same environmental details, but they also share a lot of the same synth presets. Both tracks even share the same hi-hat pattern, albeit in different tempos. By reusing the sound palette from other songs in similar locations, an alien world can become strangely familiar and welcoming in a subconscious way. With some of the presets identified, we can begin work on music. For this mini-series, I chose Torvis Bog as the track we'll be working on. I've done this track before back in 2019, but I wanted to revisit it to fix some minor mistakes. First, let's load the reference track into FL Studio and find a tempo. Torvis Bog has a BPM of 140. 
Then we pull up the presets that we want to play on our gear. Let's start off with More Senses, Bliss, and Ethereal, all of which come from the XL1 Turbo. Here I'm starting off with sequencing the More Senses pad, listening to where notes begin and end, and then transcribing those same notes by painting them into the piano roll. More Senses is a preset that can be kind of tricky to transcribe because each note plays with a perfect fifth interval. So when you play a minor chord, it actually makes the sound of the more complex minor ninth chord instead. Bliss and Ethereal play the same part together throughout the track. Both of these have such great ambient qualities to them, with Bliss providing the higher frequencies while Ethereal's low mid sound provides some tonality. In my first Torvis Bog cover, I used a preset from the Proteus 2000 for this arpeggiated synth with delay effect heard here. This was before I knew the EA-1 was used in Metroid Prime 2, and it wasn't until I was working on my Torvis Catacombs recreation several months ago that I realized the same EA-1 preset used in that track was also used for this part in Torvis Bog. Some presets require automation. In this case, we need to control the delay depth on the EA-1. Some trial and error was needed in order to get the automation sounding exactly right. It's slowly but surely coming together. And with that, we'll conclude this session for today. In the next video, we'll continue working on Torvis Bog and add more parts such as percussion and samples and MS-2000 whistles. Let's wrap up with something I found while doing research for this video. In 2007, the website Original Sound Version conducted an interview with Kenji Yamamoto and Retro Studios audio supervisor Scott Peterson about working on Metroid Prime 3. In the early stages of development, the composer was able to visit Retro Studios in Austin, Texas and have a rare face-to-face -face meeting with the team, discussing the music direction for the game. Scott Peterson had this to say. The cool thing was that after we got our musical direction discussion out of the way, we were able to geek out and exchange ideas about audio tools, music in general, and even have a quick jam session. It was truly an honor that I got to play drums with Yamamoto-san's excellent guitar playing and our CEO Michael Kelbaugh's kick-ass bass playing. Yamamoto-san added, It was a great moment. In that musical session, I felt in my bones that music was and is the true universal language, and I knew I could cultivate an even deeper trust and friendship with them. This quote resonates with me, because I truly feel the same way about music being this universal language that creates connections with others, regardless where they're from. I've seen countless messages and comments about the content I produce and how much it means to so many. Some people have told me they've listened to my music while they're taking a long car trip or even during recovery at the hospital. I'm humbled to hear that my work is able to provide entertainment even during times like that. I'm just as equally grateful to be able to talk with amazing folk like Z Time and Kiwi Talks, both of whom reached out to me because of this research, which started out as just a hobby. 
all these worldwide connections from all sorts of backgrounds are made possible thanks to a nearly 20 year old Japanese video game soundtrack. To me, that's incredible. And it completely validates what Yamamoto-san said because his music is still connecting people to this very day. This is Cinemax. Thanks for watching.